right, so let's look at our first discrete random variable. And as I read example two, see if you can be on the listen for our favorite. What is the variable, right? That's always the first part of our problem we wanna unpack. So in example two, all right, we have a child psychologist is interested in the number of times that a newborn baby's crying wakes its mother after midnight. For a random sample of 50 mothers, the following information was obtained. Two mothers were not woken up. 11 mothers were woken up once. 23 mothers were woken up twice. Nine mothers were woken up three times. Four mothers were woken up four times. And one mother was woken up five times. No mothers were woken up more than five times after midnight. Okay. So with all of that, maybe you spotted the variable, maybe you saw the data that we were be get, being given about this variable, but I'm gonna start these problems by setting you up pretty well with what the variable, what we're getting at with the variable, all right? So X, it's the number of times what? Well, it's the number of times a mother, all right? And we can say a num the number of times a mother is woken up by her newborn after midnight. And while I was reading, maybe, maybe you heard it right here. It says it right here. The number of times a newborn baby's crying wakes its mother after midnight. And as we progress through chapter four, especially in chapter four, you're gonna see the, that phrasing a lot, the number of something. That's a real giveaway in terms of what your variable is. All right, so if we start going a little further, is this variable, discrete or continuous? Would I count the number of times that a mother was woken up by her baby or would I measure it? And I think you can hear it's discrete, I would count it. And another good rule of thumb just for chapter four, it, it's always discrete. That's, that's what we're dealing with in chapter four. Um, in chapter five and six, we'll pick up the continuous variables and then it'll be uh, free for all, fair game in terms of the problems. But for right now, while we're in chapter four, they're always discrete. Um, X takes on what's, what values, what's its sample space? Well, you can hear it here. Two mothers were not woken up, right? Some were woken up once, twice, three times, four times, and one poor mom was woken up five times after midnight. So I'm gonna go ahead and write that out. Zero, one, two, three, four, and five. And then I'm gonna ask you to construct a frequency table. So back in chapter one, we made frequency distributions, all right? And we tended to make them vertically, where our variable was always on our leftmost column and then the frequencies were on the right of that. And then if you'll remember in chapter one, we also went from frequency to relative frequency. We also jumped to cumulative frequency and we also jumped to cumulative relative frequency. So I just wanna take us back to chapter one. We're gonna create a frequency table. This time I'm gonna do it horizontally and we do it horizontally, just it's the standard notation we have in stats. It's not wrong if you do it vertically, like we did in chapter one, but it tends to be when we get into um, discrete random variables, we tend to write them horizontally. So here's what I mean by that. Instead of writing the values of my variable in my leftmost column, I'm gonna write the values of my variable in my top row. So I'm gonna take these six numbers and I'm gonna write them in a table, all right? And I need, I always need two rows for these tables. All right, so in chapter four, we're gonna make plenty of tables together and you're, you're gonna have two rows every time out. So let's make a table of two rows and I'm gonna have six options and that top row, one for each of the values of my variable. Plus I give myself um, one more column just to make a label and I'll show you what I mean.
All right, so let's get going with this. So I, I always pick my first column for my label, and then I put my sample space up here. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, like so. All right, and so I counted here, I had one, two, three, four, five, six values, so I needed seven columns. All right, so in the bottom, we're gonna put the frequencies. And if you, if you feel like it, like maybe, it, it is Friday night when I'm recording this, if you get a little, uh, crazy on a Friday night, you could add to it the cumulative frequency row, the relative frequency, or cumulative relative frequency, right? We can rem remember zigzagging. But I want the frequencies, and I'm going to find those in the wordings of my problem. So two mothers were not woken up. So I know there's a frequency count of two here. All right, and then when I start to read this, right, 11 mothers were woken up once, 23 mothers were woken up twice, nine mothers three times, what do we have, four mothers four times, and one mom here, okay? I always think it's a good idea to check your frequencies, all right? We did this back in chapter one. When you add up your frequencies, it should total out to your sample size. If it doesn't, then something went wrong and it's a great little indicator that, hey, I need to check something out. So let me go fire up my calculator and see what we got going on here. I'm gonna add those frequencies, and I'm hoping when I hit enter right now, it's gonna pop back to 50. It does, that's great, it should. All right, so I'm gonna say here, this sums to 50, and that is fantastic. All right, so that's that chapter one topic. But what we wanna switch from, now that we've gone through chapter three, now that we've made it through probabilities and related those to relative frequencies, we're gonna switch over from something called a frequency table to really the relative frequency table, but it's gonna get a fun new name. It's gonna be called the probability distribution function or PDF. All right, so the PDF for a discrete random variable, all right, discrete random variable X given the probability, or gives the probability associated with each pos possible X value. All right, so I'm gonna read this again because I didn't do the greatest job reading it. The PDF of a discrete random variable x gives the probability associated with each possible value of x. So we're literally gonna talk about between these six values for x, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, where did the probabilities get, get um, distributed? Is it mostly on the zeros? Is it mostly on the fours? Is it mostly on the twos and threes? We wanna figure out where were the probabilities distributed? How were they passed out amongst those values of x. So common ways to display a probability distribution function for a discrete random variable are a table, and I underline that because that is the most common one that we're gonna get. Um, you can make a histogram, I'll show you how to do that. Um, I'll, I'll show you how to do that with this example just for fun, or, or a formula. These, these we won't really get to as much, but we'll spend some time on tables. And when it comes to tables, there are two main rules that deal with them, uh, deal with tables. So in order to be a legitimate table, it, you have to pass through these two um, properties. Every probability has to be a number between zero and one. That was true in chapter three, and it's true for the rest of the semester. So between zero and one, those numbers on the bottom row when we make our table, right, because we're gonna replace our frequencies with probabilities in a moment, every number on that bottom row is gonna have to be a number between zero and one. And then that bottom row, instead of summing to your sample size, will have to sum to one. And if you remember back in chapter one, that relative frequency column summed to one. So these two concepts we've seen before, but we're gonna talk about them in the context of this table right now. So what I'm about to do is I'm basically gonna redraw the shot, the shape and size of this table. I'm still gonna have my variables on the top, but I'm gonna change this bottom row from frequencies to relative frequencies. And instead of calling them relative frequencies, we're gonna call them probabilities. So we're gonna use this P of X symbol. So let me scooch this up, give me some time to make a table. And then we're, we're gonna make our PDF. So we, we're actually making a PDF together. This is our first PDF of many PDFs that we will be making.
right, so again, you're seeing I had six values in my variable, and I'm only going to write 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I actually, with the six values, I make seven columns because I want a label column. On this bottom row, we're going to put P of X. All right, so we're going to start putting relative frequencies down here, but we're going to label them as probabilities because those are interchangeable. Um, so let's, let's try and remember back to chapter one. All right, I'm going to scoot back up to the table that we just made so we can reference it. I can't get them both in the same view screen, but that's okay. So if we remember from chapter one, I'll ask this, how do we go from frequencies to relative frequencies? All right, how do I take these whole numbers and turn them into percentages, probabilities, proportions, ratios, fractions? And the answer back in chapter one is the same answer we have today. You take your frequency and you divide it by your sample size. So instead of writing two on my new PDF that I'm creating down here, I'm gonna to go to my calculator, I'm gonna take two, and I'm gonna divide it by 50. So I'm gonna write the relative frequency, the proportion, the probability of 0.04. Okay. So let me get these into view, and then we're gonna start making our PDF. So this first probability is 0.04. Okay. Now so that I'm not just scooching back up and down the whole time, we'll just remember the numbers. So there were 11 mothers that were woken up exactly one time. So I want to take that and I want to go 11 divided by 50 and I will find out that that probability is 22%. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to repeat this for the numbers associated with moms getting woken up twice after midnight, three, four, and five times. And you can do this on your calculation screen. That's not a problem. I just want to be a little bit more efficient. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into my lists. I'm going to clear out whatever was in there. And I'm going to write my frequencies, 2, 11, 23, 9, 4, and 1. And basically, everything or all the numbers I want to get for my new PDF here come from taking these numbers and dividing them by 50. And instead of repeating that on my calculator over and over again, I'm going to go up into the definition of L2 and I'm going to use my calculator like a spreadsheet and say, hey, can you take everything in L1 and can you please divide it by 50? And when I hit enter, that's going to auto populate. So what do we got there? My numbers, you can see the 4%, the 22%, I'm going to copy the rest of these in here. All right, so we'll go 46, 18, 8, and then finally 2%. Okay, and let's just do a quick check. All right, what do these sum to? All right, and if you remember from chapter one, they, there's a very specific number that these, these probabilities should sum to. I'm gonna show you two ways to do this on your calculator. I'm gonna just add these numbers on my calculation screen initially, and then I'm gonna show you how you can just add all the numbers on a list with a calculator command. So let me add these five, no, excuse me, these six numbers. And when I hit enter, I get one, fantastic. It absolutely should sum to one, or 100%. Now, if I didn't want to type all of this out, you can always, we did this once before, if you hit second in stat and go over to math, use your right arrow key, hit option five, you can see it right there. It says sum. Now, my relative frequencies were in L2, and they do sum to one, okay? So this is it. This is a PDF. So a PDF table, which is what we'll be dealing with in chapter four, Again, you'll either have to make them like we did in this problem, or they might be given to you. But these tables always have two rows. The top row is labeled X, and the bottom row is labeled probability of X. So the top row is always the values of your variable, right? your sample space in here. And then the bottom row is always these probabilities, and these numbers have to add up to one. right? They specifically have to be numbers between zero and one, 
and they have to add up to one. Those are the two properties that you need to have a legitimate PDF. Okay. Now I am going to scooch up just a little bit because I want to take you back to something that I had mentioned before, but I want to I want to circle back to. So I had mentioned that PDFs, the most common way we're going to see them are in tables, but I also want you to see a histogram. Okay. Now in order to see a histogram, I got to change my lists a little bit. I'll leave the relative frequencies here, but, but I actually need the values of my variable in a list. So let me put my variables in. These moms can be woken up zero, one, two, three, four, or five times. Now we've made histograms before, but it's been a little while, so let's review it. I'm gonna go into my stat plots. I have a feeling the last thing I made was from chapter 12, and I, and I was a scatter plot, but let me switch it. So let me go into here and edit this a bit. I want us to make a histogram. I do have the values of my variable in L1, and they're, well, they're technically their relative frequencies in L2, but that's set up, that's ready to go. So let me hit zoom nine, and I want us to just get a look, oh my, at what this histogram might look like. Now, we've done this before. We did this in chapters one and two, where you get a histogram with a zoom nine window, and it's awful. Look at how large that rectangle is. So if I hit window, we can start to see why that rectangle is off. They're making a rectangle every five units. And if we just move this out of the way for a moment, you can see my variable is not jumping by five units. It's jumping by one unit. So let me go ahead and switch this and say, hey, can you please just make me a rectangle every one unit? And the other thing I'm just noticing is it looks like the X max was at 10, right? And if I look at my X max, it's at five. So I'm gonna have some space on the right. I might still adjust this window. So let me hit graph and you can see, right? It's kind of scrunched over here in the left-hand corner. It's looking pretty good, but it's still scrunched. So I don't need all of this room over here. I also don't need all of this room on the top. So I'm gonna change my window a bit just so that my, my graph looks a little bit nicer. So I don't need all of this room. I'm gonna to go to six instead. And I didn't need it to be all that tall, so let me go to six over here, not on the Y scale, oops. I think it was 10 before. I didn't need this to be that tall. I'm seeing 1.14, I don't need 610. So 1.14 is too high. If we look, our highest Y value was gonna be 46%. So I'm gonna change this to about 60%, all right? I think that's a better fitting window. Um, so let me hit graph, and now I can start to really see that histogram, right? So if I hit trace, we're seeing 4%, 22%, the way I have it in there. I would say this is roughly symmetric, right? Uh, looking at it, it looks like the middle, the mean and median is somewhere around two or three, that would be my guess, right? I, I can see that I have a range of five. I'm spread from zero to five. If I wanted to figure out outliers, I could calculate the IQR and see if, you know, multiply by one of 1.5, get a safety zone. I could see if I had any outliers, but I could basically talk about this, this graph with my socks if I wanted to. We don't need to do that for this problem, but I just wanted you to see that yes, we made a table, but you could also have made a histogram. All right, so we're gonna keep practicing these and I will catch you on the next example. All right, bye guys.